When you're there, say amen. You good? And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take thou thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of uh, Moriah, sorry, excuse me, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for, for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I will have the lad. And I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife. And they both, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire in the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told them of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in, the, in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. I want to talk to you a few minutes about sacrifice. Talk to you about how far are you willing to go in Jesus? How far you will let him take you? Everything that is done is done for your good and your glory. But it is hard to see that sometimes. It is tough to see through the pain. And the Lord has a plan. We just have to be willing to sacrifice it all to trust in a hard love. Let us pray. Father, we love you, Jesus. We know the, we know the road will be tough sometimes. We know that the work of the ministry is not easy. From time with you, filling our spiritual tank to witnessing the people that don't want to hear that they are lost. Lord, we pray that you would give us strength in these last days to make the journey home. Father, we know the last mile of the race is the, always the hardest. Lord, just keep your hand upon us. Watch over us. And Lord, always, you're always in the fire. And in or out of that fire, we will give you honor, glory, and praise in Jesus' wonderful name. And all that so serve no other, shouted, amen. amen, and amen. In our story, we find that Abraham has been called by God to take his son Isaac and offer him up as a burnt offering in the land of Moriah. Moriah. It is the supreme test of Abraham's faith. The words that God spoke to Abraham must have pierced his heart like a deepened wound. Isaac was Abraham's only son. He was the only son of promise, the unique son, the son of miraculous birth. Isaac is the son that the covenant would be carried out through. How can he be sacrificed? It's a hard love. Abraham doesn't know quite what is going on. He just knows what the Lord has told him. So come early in the morning, they rise and set out on their way to where God has told him to go. On the third day, Abraham sees a place far off. He stops. Abraham tells his men to wait here. Him and his son will continue and be back after they worship. They grab the wood, the fire, and the knife. And Isaac and Abraham strike out. I'm sure on this journey, Abraham has thoughts of what's going to take place. 
This is an act of ultimate test of Abraham's faith. God has promised to give Abraham a numberless prosperity through his son. Isaac could have been as much as 25 at this time, is what scholars say, and he was unmarried. If he was going to be sacrificed, how could the promise be fulfilled? Abraham believed that even if he killed Isaac, the Lord would bring him back to life. The faith is remarkable because there is no record of any case of resurrection up until this time in the world's history. Notice also his faith in verse 5. The lad and I will go and worship and then return. Abraham was justified by faith and justified by works here. His faith was the means of his salvation, while his works were the proof of the reality of his faith. We need to grab a hold of that. We need to have the faith, then act on that faith, walk in that faith, live in that faith. By faith, the Lord will come through, but it's tough. It's a hard love. When Isaac asked where the lamb is, his father replied, God will provide himself a lamb. Then they come to the place the Lord had told him to go, and Abraham builds an altar, lays the wood out, tied Isaac up, and lays him on the altar, raises the knife to kill his son. What a scene. What a testimony of faith. Abraham's faith to the Lord and Isaac's faith to Abraham. Abraham is now 100 years old. Isaac is in his 20s. He could have easily gotten away and ran. You ain't killing me, Pops. But Abraham could have said, no, I won't do it to the Lord. He could have told him no. But they both held on to the Lord. And that's the hard, and that's hard sometimes to do when you're not really sure what the plan is. It's hard to have that kind of faith for the big stuff. We have faith for the small stuff, but maybe because if it doesn't happen, it doesn't really matter. Hmm. Or, or it won't affect us as much. But when it comes to the big stuff, watch out. We start to panic when it starts to take too long or it's not going as we think it should. I get it. Having faith in itself is a hard love. Now Abraham's about to plunge the knife into his son and set him on fire. And then we read Genesis 22. 11 and 18, 11 through 18. And the angel of the Lord called upon, called, called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, lay that, not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his thorn, or by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to be said to this day, and the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, said the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thee seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Take heed to that last part. Obey his voice. And just as Abraham is about to slay Isaac, the Lord calls to him, Abraham, Abraham, hear my Lord. I wonder if he's thinking, oh, thank God. Thank you, Jesus. I don't have to kill him yet. Do not lay a hand on your son. Because I know 
that you fear as the Lord, and you have not withheld your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes, and there was a ram in the thicket. And Abraham takes the ram and offers offers him instead offers the ram instead of his son. And Abraham takes the ram for the offering. And then the Lord calls him again and tells him, because of his faithfulness, not to deny the Lord Isaac, he will bless him, and he will have more offspring than the stars in the sky, more children than the sand on the shores of the beach. For, for Abraham and Isaac, it's been a hard love to follow the Lord's will. I can take you to the place the Lord told me to, to step out, and I will take care of you. I can take you to the exact spot I was standing. The first time I heard it, I thought, I, I didn't really hear that. I kind of ignored it. I was standing in the shop. The second time I heard it, eh, I don't know about all that. I pondered to wrestle with it for a while, for a couple of days. I talked to Manna. It'll be okay. Mm. So I finally did it after prayer. It's probably a couple months. And then I left the job I had spent a lifetime building. I was used to making it in my own way, relying on myself. That's a hard place to come out of. I grew up poor. And then to build up a career and to let it all go was crazy talk. She was working, but it was not enough to pay all the bills. If I put it out on paper and you saw it wrote out, you'd be like, there ain't no way. <laughs> I don't know how it happened. I guess the Lord took two nickels and rubbed them together and it rained money. The only thing I can tell you. <coughs> the two older kids were working. Hayden was in school. We had Mila and Amanda was pregnant with Tegan. And I left a job making 100000 a year and walked in the Lord's will. We had a prayer meeting one night. I think it was in February. I'm not really too sure. Matter of fact, I know it was in February because I left in January. And I didn't start snap on until the end of February. I told Amanda she could go. I would stay home and watch the kids. So I was with Milo. I started to get in my feelings, <sighs> pacing around the house. You know what? We ain't never going to make it. I might have to go back. I never said that out loud. It never came out of my mouth. I kind of got over the idea and went back in the house. I just knew... I was like, we ain't going to do it. I went back to doing some house chores, probably playing with Mila. I don't really remember. About 30 minutes later, Amanda comes home. I walk open the front door to greet her, and she says, I got a message for you. Do you now? She said, I do. The Lord told me to tell you, I didn't bring you out of Egypt for you to go back. Copy that. Copy that. I knew that I hadn't said that to anybody, even spoke it out loud. So nobody could have heard it on a phone by accident. Nobody could have been sneaking around the corner of the house. I knew where it came from. So I took a job making half of what I was making. Then about five months later, the Lord said, step out, and I will take care of you. Lord, where are we going? Step out, and I will take care of you. Okay. You're going to have to take care of Amanda, because I don't even know where we're going. I stepped out. I left that job, and I didn't punch a clock for 13 months. Then punch a clock. We'd pray, and all of a sudden, I would get some work, and the, and the bills would be paid. Now, sometimes it would uh, 
it would be towards the end of the month. I'm like, my Lord, you're getting, uh, we're getting kind of close here. This bill needs to be paid. I'm looking at them. Boom. I get a call. Something out of the blue would happen. Hallelujah. We paid all the bills. I can tell you in those 13 months, we paid all of our bills. We paid off a bill. We took care of Draven when he was out injured. And we took care of another family. All on a budget that didn't exist. Yes, was it? It was a hard love, definitely. Because if I looked at the bills as they were piled up on the desk, Lord, I hope I sure hope you know what you're doing. Because I don't. It was definitely a hard love. The Lord will provide. But to walk in that Lord's will is sometimes a hard love. In our story, there are two outstanding symbols of Christ in this chapter. Isaac is the first and only son loved by his father, willing to do the father's will. Abraham's love for his son is a a faint picture of God's love for Jesus. The sacrifice of Isaac was a picture of the greatest act of worship one could display. And that that display is the Savior's self-sacrifice to accomplish the will of God. The ram was the second. An innocent victim died as a substitute for another. Its blood was shed, and it was it was a burnt offering, wholly consumed for God. Some have said that in providing the ram as a substitute for Isaac, God spared Abraham's heart a pain he would not spare his own. To save us all from judgment and eternal death. God and Jesus performed a hard love. How hard was that love? It was hard. John tells us in John 15, 12 through 13, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I have fought all, all my life, whether it was spiritual and didn't know it, or it was physical. There has always been a fight. From hanging myself in this <clears throat> in this church to running a to running my truck off a road and into a pole. And I can tell you, it's always been a fight. When I was thirteen or fourteen, I don't really remember which, my mother had kicked me out of the house. That was pretty bad. She kicked me out. She couldn't deal with me no more. So living on the streets, I ended up staying with a friend. His dad had a shotgun and with nobody home. I got to a, I got to a place. I was like, well, you know what? I'll just, I'll just go home and take that shotgun and end it all. It's crazy, isn't it? I think ended up, somebody ended up coming home before I could get to it. I just remember that I was how how bad the fight was. From fighting off suicide, from growing up in a violent home, to surviving gang fights and drug deals gone wrong. But I've been willing to lay down my life for my friends, my family. My family knows if something were to break out, I would be the first to lay myself down. You can rest assured if something were to happen here, I would be the first in the combat. Not because I'm better, but because I know what I'm capable of. I would lay myself down for each one in this room. And it includes you, Sister Debbie, if you're listening. But my willingness to sacrifice myself is nowhere near close to what Jesus did for us all. Matthew 27, 26 through 37. 
and release he Babis unto them, Barabbas, sorry. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the gov governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered him, unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put him on a scarlet robe. And when they had planted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his, in his right hand. And they bowed a knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him. And they took the reed and smote him on the head. And after that, they had mocked him. They took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man, a siren, Simon, by the name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were, were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is said, a place of skull. They gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted his garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. We find here that Jesus has been rejected. The crowd has said right before, before this his blood be on us and on our children. And since then, the people of Israel have been from the ghetto to an organized massacre, from concentration camps to the gas chamber, suffering the awful guilt of the blood of the rejected Messiah. And they still face the seven years of tribulation. The curse will remain until they acknowledge the re rejected Jesus as their king with a hard love. Pilate released Barabbas to the crowd, and that murder and spirit has dominated the world ever since. The righteousness, the righteous king was rejected. It was customary that the, the once condemned be scourged. A scourge is a large leather strap with bits of sh sharp metal embedded in it brought down across the back. Hmm. Each lash opening the flesh and releasing streams of blood. Now there was nothing the spineless governor could do but to turn Jesus over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. The soldiers took Jesus into the governor's palace and gathered a whole garrison around Jesus, more than likely several hundred men. What happens next is hard to imagine. The creator of the universe, the one who made the moon and the stars, suffered unspeakable indignities from cruel, vulgar soldiers. They stripped the Lord and made him wear a mark, a mock red king's robe. But the robe was a message for us. I like to think of it this way. I like to think that the robe pictures my sins being placed on Jesus so that God's robe of righteousness might be placed on me. Even in the Lord's torment and pain, he was still thinking of us. Now, that's a hard love. The soldiers twisted a, a, some thorns together into a crown, and they pressed it on out on his head. Beyond their cruel jest, we know he wore a crown of thorns so that we, we could wear a crown of glory. <laughs> Amen. They mocked him as king of sin. We worship him as a savior of sinners. They gave him a reed, a mock scepter, and knelt before him and addressed him as king of the Jews, all in cruel torment. They spit on his face. They spit on the face of the only perfect man to ever walk this earth. 
Then they took the reed from his hand and hit him in the head. Finally, they put his clothes back on him and led him to be crucified. Jesus never said a word. He bore it all with patience. Our Lord carried his cross part of the way. The soldiers got a a man named Simon to help him carry the rest. They marched Jesus to Calvary. And right before he was stuck on the cross, they offered him some sour wine. The concoction was made as an opiate to alleviate the pain. Jesus refused to take it. For it was necessary to bear the full load of the cross without any impairment to his senses or no alleviation of his pain. The soldiers nailed him to the cross and gambled. When I read it in the word, in the word, I was like, "The cast lots it was like rolling dice." They were gambling to see who would get his clothes. His robe was his entire estate. The one perfect life that has been lived in this world is the life of Jesus, who owned nothing. And who left nothing but the clothes he wore. He is on the cross for about six hours. And then he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God is holy and he he cannot overlook sin. He must punish it. The Lord Jesus had no sin of his own, but took the guilt of our sins upon himself When God, as judge, looked down and saw his sins upon the sinless substitute, he withdrew for his son his love. It was this separation that wrung from the heart of Jesus. And four verses later, he cries out with a loud voice. He yielded up his spirit. The loud cry demonstrates that the Lord died in strength and not in weakness. He yielded up his spirit, distinguishes distinguishes his death from all others. We die because we have to. He died because he chose to. And now that nail-scarred hand that held a, a reed meant to mock is the hand that rules the world. The Lord and Savior chose to show the hard love. Stand and I'll close. Actually, hold on. Dragon, will you come play? Sorry. You heard about man's dream. About the line of the king of Judah. Jesus is coming. The hard love is that Jesus went to the cross for us. Y'all need to understand what he went through. I think some people just kind of nonchalantly, yeah, I'm a Christian. But what did he really endure for us? And what are you willing to do for him if you're unaware about the about the stuff in Russia the war's not over property of Ukraine I hate to tell you that it's over a pathway I was talking to a friend of mine at work the other day I said, dude, Israel's a prize. Israel has always been the prize. Israel will always be the prize. They take over Ukraine because it's a straight shot to Israel. So when they amass the mount, the massive army, they can just pipe it on straight there and it saves them a couple days' journey. I heard the other day, that Russia supplies, I think it was, don't quote me, somewhere around 90% of the UK's oil. So when the UK starts getting lippy, 
Russia cuts back their oil. They can't survive without it. So Israel has discovered that they have a vast amount of, I think it was compressed natural gas or LP gas. They have fuel, and they're making a pipeline straight to the U.K. Mm. So now Russia is upset. They're fixing to take money out, money and control out of Russia's pocket. The end is coming soon. Jesus will return shortly. The Lord chose the path of hard love so that we could have the capability of living with him forever. He gave everything for us. Do we give everything for him? Will we will we be willing to sacrifice everything for our Lord? Even our most prized possession. Oh, Brother Paul, you were preaching a bunch of doom and gloom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would rather be telling you about how great and powerful the Lord is. I would rather be showcasing that instead of his death. It's a hard love. It's a warning. The end is upon us. They had been saying that for, for years. Well, they might have. But there'll be scoffers in the end. And if you're unaware of what's going on around outside us, you better pick that book up and read it. Because it's unfolded before our eyes. What will we do? Will we pretend to live in a bubble and think the other side of the world will never come here? You better think again. You better pray really hard about that. There is a reason that America is not in the book of Revelations. So if you don't know him, you don't, you know him, but don't really truly live for him. Or you live for him, but you're not completely sold out. I would, I would come. I would probably run to these altars and get as close to the Lord as you can. Yeah. He will have you do some things that you don't want to do. He's going to have you do some, some stuff you will have to lay down. Say some things you don't want to say. Go places you don't want to go. Forgive people that you don't want to forgive. He never said it would be easy. He just said it would be worth it. Jesus said he would be in the fire with us. And let me tell you, that fire is a hard love. Father, I love you, Jesus. Lord, I hope I make you proud. I just want to be in your will. Lord, I pray that this word, your word, has found good ground. That we as believers will realize that coming in, it will get worse before it gets better. Because, Lord, they hated you. They will hate us too. Lord, I pray that you would give us all strength in these last days. Keep us in your hands. Guide us by your spirit. And as always, all the honor, the glory, and the praise will go to you. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Come and gather around.